end and feel free to put your questions in chat any time and then Bryn and I will be moderating the question and answer time. I'm really honored to be introducing our speaker for today, Ambassador Barbara Bodine. I first met Ambassador Bodine in 2015 at our UCEAP 50th celebration in honor of Hong Kong and the UK. Um, that event was at, up at UCSF, and she graciously um, agreed to share her study abroad experience with the audience there, and so I'm thrilled that she's here again today to talk a little bit about that. I also brought a photo from that event. We, um, let's see if the photo pops up here. There you go. Can everyone see that photo? There we are um, with our speakers from the event, and it was really a fun evening. Uh, to our left, we have our former recently retired academic dean, Shu Zhu Ho, and speaker Kamal Thomas, who also studied in Hong Kong. And then in the yellow tie was our featured speaker, Randy Sheckman, who's a Nobel laureate from Berkeley, and then Ambassador Bodine. But the two gentlemen in the middle actually were just very, very um, happy alumni who photobombed all of our photos that evening. So uh, it was exciting. They were really enthused to be there. So Ambassador Bodine studied abroad, as I said, in um, Hong Kong uh, with us in 1968 at the Chinese U University of Hong Kong. Uh, at UC Santa Barbara, she majored in political science and Asian studies. And then she received her master's from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. After a 30-year career in foreign service, including posts in Yemen and Kuwait, Ambassador Bodine is currently the Distinguished Professor of, in the Practice of Diplomacy and the Director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy, that's a long title, at the yeah. School of Foreign Service of Georgetown University. Uh, we are thrilled to have you with us today. Please welcome Ambassador Bodine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to, to be able to, to meet with all of you today. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Um, I am a very enthusiastic uh, supporter of the UC program and, and education abroad writ large. Um, and I'm always telling, I actually once gave a graduation speech at a small school in California and um, I think I horrified the, the parents because the, the title of my graduation speech was uh, go out and get dirty. <laughs> um, and basically what I was saying is, you know, get out of your nice, comfortable California bubble and go someplace where you will learn a lot more about yourself than you. The academics are good. The learning experience for yourself is, is invaluable. So I've been asked to sort of, first of all, give kind of an overview of how I see the world, a little bit on diplomacy, and then I'll talk a lot more about um, being a kid in, in Hong Kong. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody. Uh, the world is kind of a mess right now. Um, the, what we call the rules-based order, or the liberal world order, I prefer rules-based, um, is being significantly challenged everywhere. Um, autocrats, uh, we have the wonderful Marcos Duterte team about to take over in the Philippines, which is just, um, if anybody served in it, if anybody did went to school in the Philippines, it's a horrifying concept. Um, we have social media, which is becoming increasingly destructive. Um, and so it's, it's pretty messy out there. Um, and we also have the Ukraine war. What, what is interesting about the Ukraine war, which is probably one of the last of the World War II conventional wars going on, is that it rather exemplifies that given the kinds of challenges that we're all facing and that particularly those of you who are considerably younger than I are going to have to fix is that we're actually moving away from a military uh, sense of how you can solve problems if they ever really did to where diplomacy is actually becoming more important. Um, as we get into these greater levels of chaos and challenge, Diplomacy is going to be the primary tool that we are going to have to use. 
if the military is never going to be obsolete, but it's not going to be the lead. And if we just think about what are some of the big challenges that we face um, as people, as a country, as a world, it's climate change. It's food insecurity. It's corruption and kleptocracies. It's highly toxic disinformation. And it's systemic racism and income equality, inequality, both within countries and between countries, among countries. Um, none of those challenges can be solved through the barrel of a gun, to borrow from Chairman Mao. Um, they are all going to take diplomacy. They're going to take finding ways to solve problems together. Another change that goes back to where we are today and these kinds of challenges is that if diplomacy was ever primarily bilateral and political, it's now regional, what's called plurilateralism, multilateralism, regionalism. Um, it's not a Manichaean war, world. Um, and we, we have to, again, as people, as countries, as diplomats, um, learn how to work through these problems, not necessarily as friends and not necessarily because we like somebody, but because it's the only way we're gonna solve the problem. And so we also have to get away from the paradigm of either friend or foe with us or against us and understand that we need to, at the same time with any given government, any given country, compete where we need to, collaborate where we have to, and confront if it's absolutely necessary, but often all at the same time with the same government. And that takes a deft kind of diplomacy to be able to do that. And I think one primary example of this would be with China. Um, we do need to compete with them in the South China Sea and they're more uh, aggressive actions there. We need to collaborate with them on uh, and cooperate with them on climate change. And we have to compete with them economically. And all of those are different, but they all need to be done simultaneously. So I feel very strongly that diplomacy uh, and, and all of diplomacy's partners are going to have are going to be at the forefront of whatever we do going forward. Another part of this is we are not a it is not a unipolar world. Um, whether or not we are, are indispensable or not is a conversation that we can have sometime. But we are not in a position to dictate to the world. I'm not sure that we ever were. Um, and I would say that at various times when we could have, we had the wisdom not to dictate. And I, I go back to the, the decades after World War II, where we were basically the only country left standing. Um, most of, much of Europe had been destroyed. Uh, the rest of the world had been dragged into the war. Um, and at, if you look at, at 1945, most of the world was also still colonies, protectorates, and dependents. Um, fast forward 80 years, and the world has changed considerably. Um, and there are regional powers, there are economic powers versus military powers, there are financial powers. And so if, if it, it was always bad form to try to dictate, it is now no longer even possible. So again, we need to have smart diplomats. We need to have smart people who are operating abroad effectively. And that brings me to uh, my experience uh, in Hong Kong. Um, my junior, I spent my entire junior year there. Uh, this is probably just the hyperbole of, of memory, but um, I seem to recall that we landed at Kai Talk. They took us to um, 
the university campus in Kowloon basically dropped us off, told us that the train to get to the new territories for the Chinese university was down the street and said, we'll come and pick you up in about 10 months. I don't think we were quite that abandoned, but um, pretty close. And um, we survived. What I thought was so good about our program compared to one or two other programs that were also going on in, in the colony, it was then a colony, was we were not operating out of a bubble of our own making, that we lived in the dorms with our Chinese roommates, we went to class with our Chinese roommates, we socialized with our Chinese uh, classmates, and um, we were fully integrated uh, into the Chinese university and, and very much into Hong Kong. And um, I am obviously uh, an Anglo woman. And I do remember at one point walking past a storefront and there was a reflection like a mirror. And I was actually surprised that I wasn't Chinese um, because I had just gotten so used to being with all of my Chinese classmates all the time that I had sort of forgotten that I looked kind of different. Um, and so that ability for a first gen college student from the wrong end of the San Fernando Valley to get dropped in Hong Kong and told, have a good time, um, was a remarkable experience for me. And I really did have to not become Chinese, I'm obviously not, but to really understand the culture and be able to operate within it comfortably um, to, to both survive and, and to hopefully do well. And so that was part of, my, of what I learned in Hong Kong was, was how do you live in another culture and understand it and become not a part of it, but comfortable, a comfortable visitor to it um, and, and not living in an American bubble. The other part, which sounds somewhat contradictory to what I just said, um, was I already knew I wanted to go into the foreign service. I had weirdly decided that when I was 15. Um, again, growing up in the wrong end of the valley, how I ended up thinking I wanted to do diplomacy was kind of remarkable. But I didn't really know what it meant. And I had the opportunity to also spend a great deal of time at the consulate general, our, our consulate general in Hong Kong. And I got to know the diplomats and I got to, you know, what kind of people are diplomats and what do they do and how do they see the world and how do they operate? And, um, you know, as a college junior, I think, you know, in retrospect, I was kind of a groupie, uh, if you can be a groupie to a diplomatic mission, um, but I was. And I, I did discover that, yes, these, this, these were the people, this was the work, this was the, the life um, that I wanted. And so it helped take my ambition to be an American diplomat and took it from a high school idea to um, a real plan. And um, I came back to, to, to UC Santa Barbara and I remember sitting down with my advisor um, and of course was full of stories, full of stories. And um, he said, well, okay, so you're an Asian studies major and you've, you've done your junior year in Hong Kong and this is all wonderful, um, but you wanna be an American diplomat. What do you know about the United States? Oops. Um, hmm. uh, if, we, if you wanna talk about Tang Dynasty literature, I'm cool. Uh, you want to talk about the roots of the Chinese Civil War? I'm great. Um, yeah, all this oh, terrific. Um, American America? Yeah, I kind of had some of that in high school. Hmm. Um, and so the reason that I am a double major in Asian studies and political science is um, he said that maybe you better go learn a little bit more about yourself 
and I spent my senior year getting a degree in political science, American political science. And I just, you know, Christmas goose stuffed um, an entire major into one year. But I learned that as part of education abroad as well, what didn't I know? Uh, not what did I know, what was I going to learn at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, which was fantastic. But I also learned what I didn't know and what I still needed to know. And I could come back and, and really focus my senior year on filling in the gaps and getting out of my comfort zone of Hong Kong and China and Asia, which is what I had done, and, and really pushing myself out academically and intellectually. Um, I was also told, you know, you have to go to grad school. And I was told one grad school, so I apply to it. Don't try that at home. Um, and um, fortunately, the gods smiled and I, I got accepted. Um, and then when three weeks after I got my master's, I was in the foreign service. Uh, so it, it really was all on sort of hyperdrive. And um, my first tour was Hong Kong. And um, two years after leaving Hong Kong as a junior year abroad, I was back in Hong Kong as a vice consul walking around with a diplomatic passport. And um, I still look like I was on my junior year abroad. Um, <laughs> I, had a little, I, had a little, I had a little trouble getting people to take me seriously. But I was then able to use, guess who got student affairs? Um, I was able to use my incredible knowledge of Hong Kong outside of the American bubble um, and what was going on and all of the neighborhoods and everything about Hong Kong helped get me launched on my career. And um, I was able to take that year and move it forward. Um, I should also, as a parenthesis, say that at the end of Hong Kong, and Hong Kong school ended like in April or something, something really early. And school at UC starts relatively late. And so I had five months between the end of school in Hong Kong and the beginning of school at UC Santa Barbara. And with all due respect to anybody here, the last thing I wanted to do was spend five months in the San Fernando Valley. That was not, I didn't have, I was too young to have a bucket list, but I did not want to do that. And so I ended up hitchhiking from Hong Kong to California going west um, and spent five months just out there um, doing stuff that at this point of I had a daughter and she did the same thing, I'd kill her. Um, <laughs> but I had the advantage that it was before cell phones, before internet, before anything. And so I just sort of dropped out for five months. Um, I would not have A, even considered doing that. B, I wouldn't have had the self-confidence that I could go out and just wander the world uh, on my own. I still didn't have the good sense to know I shouldn't, but I had the self-confidence to think I could. Um, and went out and saw all sorts of the rest of the world in five months. And so, you know, it all goes back to being accepted into the education abroad program and, and going. Um, and so, I, I am, you know, a, a somewhat tedious advocate to get students to go out and do that sort of thing. Um, I see no downside to taking time away to do education abroad and an entire world of benefit to getting to do it. And so here I am now as a somebody who never knew she could actually be a diplomat, now a retired diplomat, and teaching students here and at previously at other universities, including a year and a half at Santa Barbara, on the wonders of the world and the wonders of diplomacy. So thank you to Education Abroad. Um, I now actively support the program. 
in order to make sure that you all and other students can go out and have the same just amazing, just amazing um, opportunity that you all provided to me. And so I think with that, I would be delighted to answer questions or tell stories or do whatever, <laughs> whatever you want. I'm, I'm yours. Sure. Thank you so much for that. Um, please, um, we don't, I don't see any questions in chat yet, but uh, I oh, have a question. On, I have a question for you and we'll give people okay. some time to enter some questions. Um, I love that you described yourself as a, as a embassy or consulate groupie. That was, um, that was great. I hadn't heard that before. Is there a way for students today, do you think, to get that kind of access to um, when they're abroad to um, the consulate or an embassy? Is there programs? I would think with security now, it might not be as easy. Oh yeah, I mean, um, it was, even when I went to Hong Kong on my first tour, um, it was one of the biggest consulates we had, you know, and you could walk in, wave at the Marine Guard. Um, actually, I dated them when I was a giant vice consul because I was so young. Um, but you could just wave at them, get in the elevator, go up to the third floor and hang out with the guys in the political section. Um, there is no way on earth you could do that now. Um, but um, there are ways, um, I mean, one thing you can, I, I would very much recommend that, that somebody who is doing a, an education abroad is to apply for the following summer uh, for an internship at the, the closest consulate general or ambassador or some uh, em embassy, um, you will be very high, you will be very competitive um, for the same reason I ended up in Hong Kong for my first tour, is that here's somebody who is in the country, presumably has the language, has already acculturalized themselves to what's going on, um, and you know, clearly has an interest. This is not somebody who's just looking for a nice summer vacation. And so you will be very competitive to do that. Um, most embassies, it's most embassies also have, they do have marine security guards and they usually have uh, you know, Friday or Saturday night open beer. Um, and you can just go and hang out. Um and you can find ways to, you know, volunteer to do stuff. Um, I mean, I didn't actually work in the consulate. I really just kind of hung out. And then after a while I was being invited to their homes and, and things like that. Um, and even if you don't have the internship or anything else like that, um, contact the people in the embassy and say, hi, um, I'm Andrew Larson, I'm here in Jordan. I'm interested in what you do in the foreign service and whatever. Could I meet you for coffee? And uh, you can meet them outside the fortresses that are now our embassies. Reach out to them and say, hi, I'm interested. I'm a student. Can I, can I buy you coffee? And um, diplomats are remarkably easy when it comes to a student who wants to talk to them about their careers, about their education. And so just reach out and say, hi, I'm here. Can I talk to you? Thank you. And now that I've used Andrew Jordan as my-, as my <laughs> Andrew has a so question. Andrew, gets, Andrew yeah. gets the first question. Yeah, um, Andrew, um, you know, he, he mentioned uh, he was in Jordan, studied abroad, but he's currently at a crossroads uh, deciding between working at a stable job as a manager in a bureaucratic state institution or joining the Peace Corps in Morocco. Uh, do ah. you think it's okay to leave my nice stable managerial job for the Peace Corps? What would be a more competitive path to the foreign service? Okay, um, and if somebody's got their hand up, I can you know, let them ask yep. the question. So okay. I can actually... Hi, Andrew. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, that's basically um, it. What is the safe bureaucratic job, managerial job that you're talking about? 
Uh, so I'm currently uh, a manager at one of the UCs for one of the, the departments here. Oh, okay. Um, that's a good job. You're getting managerial and work experience. Um, does your heart tell you you want to go to the Peace Corps in Morocco? Yeah. Then, okay, <laughs> we have an answer. Gotcha. Um, okay. <laughs> um, no, really. I mean, first of all, if that's what you want to do in your heart, you should do it. I. I actually thought about the Peace Corps, but I ended up fast tracking that I didn't have time. Um, and maybe at some point I'll, I'll be part of the Great Guard. Um, do the Peace Corps, first of all, it's a wonderful experience. I don't know anybody who did Peace Corps who regrets it. Um, second, um, it actually will make you more competitive for the Foreign Service. Part of it will be the skills you learn, part of it will be the experiences that you have. Um, and third, there's a lot of Peace Corps folk in the State Department. Um, we sometimes joke that, that we're basically the Peace Corps with a paycheck. Um, it's very much the same kind of work. And so when we're looking at applicants, both the, you know, the famous six essays and then particularly the oral, Somebody who has lived abroad, not just traveled abroad, not just visited abroad, not just been a tourist abroad, but lived abroad in a culture and actually been a part of that the way Peace Corps will have you do. We know that the Foreign Service is going to be a lifestyle that you are going to be able to be comfortable in. Um, because the Foreign Service and diplomacy, it's you know, one of my taglines when I used to recruit was, it's not a job, it's not a career, it's a lifestyle. You're living abroad, you're living in different countries, you're living where you may or may not have the language, you hopefully will have the language, but you're going to be an outsider. And can you operate? Can you not just operate and survive, but do you thrive in that kind of environment? And when we look at someone who's done Peace Corps, the answer is, Yes, they, they can. Oh, so, so, so first of all, follow your heart, yeah. follow your gut, and then take the test. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. That's wonderful. I think I'll ask Tina's question really quick because it's a fast one. What years were you in Hong Kong? Oh, I was back in the days of the dinosaurs. Um, 1969 to 70. Um, so it was, it was a long time ago. Okay, excellent. I know that we have many questions in the chat, but Linda, I saw that your hand was up. Did you have a question that you wanted to ask quickly or shall we move in to the chat here? I think you're still muted if you want to unmute real quick. There you go. Oh, I did ask it in the chat. I was wondering where else you served besides Hong Kong and any challenges? Oh, okay. Um, this will take a minute or two. Um, I went from Hong Kong to Taiwan to Bangkok um, to the Secretary of State staff to then I switched and I became the country officer uh, for Yemen and Saudi Arabia in the Office of Arabian Peninsula Affairs in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. And from there, I went to Arabic language training. So five years of Chinese, and now I'm going to take Arabic. Um, I was the deputy chief of mission in Baghdad during the Iran-Iraq war, came back, worked on the Hill for a year, moved to be the country officer for the occupied territories, Palestine, uh, Golan, and Gaza. Um, and from there, I went to be the deputy director of the Office of Arabian Peninsula Affairs. And from there, I became deputy chief of mission in Kuwait, 1989 to 1990. So I was there when the Iraqis invaded, um, was the last American out of Kuwait. And from there, I became the coordinator for counterterrorism operations for the US government. And then the overall coordinator for counterterrorism policy for the US government. And from there, I went, oh yeah, 
I was a director of East African Affairs, which I had never served in in my life. And from there, I became ambassador to Yemen. And from there, I came to Santa Barbara for a year because I really needed a break. And um, then I went to Baghdad in 2003, very auspicious year to be going to Baghdad, and uh, came back, did one more year in the department and called it quits. So particular challenges, um, many, always. Um, I think I kind of gravitate towards challenges. I mean, to go back to my EAP desire, um, I was told that I couldn't go to Hong Kong, that girls didn't go to Hong Kong, that girls didn't do education abroad, uh, which obviously you had been alive because you went to Spain before I went to Hong Kong, but there was basically, you can't go to Hong Kong. Um, and um, I went. So I kind of, I, I'm kind of, a, I look for challenges. Um, ended up in several war zones. Um, and I, I will not, I will, I will say that there were definitely days that I kind of wished I was someplace else, but both personal challenges of being first a very young woman in the foreign service, being a woman in the foreign service. I was almost in all of those jobs. I was the first woman and often the only woman wherever I was. Uh, first woman diplomat um, and the only one in my embassy. So gender was first age and age and gender and then just gender uh, were constant challenges and the environments in which I was several war zones. Um, I never wanted to do anything else though. I never, I mean, there were days, absolutely. I don't think we've, you know, anybody who works um, in any position has had days where I'm out of here. You know, I've, I've had it, you know, I just, I'm not gonna do this anymore. Thank you very much, I'm gone. Um, and then you kind of walk yourself back and kind of go and do what? And I don't think it was just simply a lack of imagination on my part, I truly, loved what I did, even in the worst of circumstances. Um, and for the 33 years I was in the, the department, I never, every time I walked into the main entrance of the State Department where we've got all those flags hanging up and everything, and I looked at the plaques, our martyrs plaques, I knew that what I was doing was important. It might not be glitzy, it might not be glamorous, I may not be famous, um, but I was working on issues that mattered and I might have a very small part of it, but I was part of it. And as I've often told students when I'm talking to them about this as a, as a life is, or any job, any job, you need to know why you're getting up at 4.30 in the morning to go to work. If you can answer why you're getting up at 4.30, much as you hate getting up at 4.30, much as you've only had five hours sleep, you know why you're getting up, then you've got the right job. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't sleep all day Saturday or Sunday um, and that you're not exhausted, but you know why you're doing it. And I was also very much aware that, that, that I wasn't playing a grand chess game, that Everything from doing, you know, the the soul sucking non immigrant visas that you have to do, to you know, dealing with a major terrorist incident, which I have had to do, that everything in between, those and everything in between, had an effect on somebody's life. That I wasn't playing an intellectual game. I was playing a real game and that my decisions, however small or however big, were going to affect somebody's life, hopefully for the better, but that it was real, that everything I did was real. And um, that also to me was, was extremely important, not for self-importance, but for the importance of the work.
Thank you. Um, yeah, I, my mother would not let have let me gone if go to Spain than if she knew there was a fascist government. She didn't, and I went. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank um, you so much. Yeah, I don't think my family even knew where Hong Kong was, um, and they never. My family never understood what I did as a diplomat. I, I, there was no way to explain it. Um, all they knew is that you're going where? <laughs> um, you know, there's a war going on. Yeah, I know. Um, so a lot of tolerance from your family is is a key component of surviving in the foreign service. Oh, yeah, well, Thank one or two you. things. I would say either tolerance or ignorance. <laughs> sometimes just keeping them ignorant is the best way to manage it thank, thank you, you. Yes. um our next question is from shad who studied it looked like in both japan and france with eap Whoa. um hi did you want to ask your question or do you um want me to read it sure i can ask it thank you so much elizabeth Please. uh hi, yeah hi hi barbara so i was curious as to um some things that because i know a lot of this a lot of probably what's your job is things you've not learned through academia. So I was wondering, what are some things that you've learned um, that you've only, that you could have only learned while on the job as a diplomat? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna challenge your basic assumption that I didn't learn anything useful at school. Um, and I'm not saying that because I'm now teaching. Um, I mean, as I said, I'm a first in family. And, and when I was in college, I remember going to a family, you know, Thanksgiving. And I, I had an uncle who was literally a lineman for the county. You know, he, if any of you are old enough to know the old uh, Glenn Campbell song, he was a lineman for the county. And he got after me at uh, Thanksgiving that, you know, universities are a waste of time because all they do is teach people how to think. Yeah. <laughs> and the downside of that is, okay, yep, I cannot string, string phone lines. Um, universities do teach you how to think and they teach you about the things you need to think about. Um, and being particularly a area studies major, um, I learned how to understand a region that I needed to know about Tang Dynasty literature and I needed to know about history and I needed to know about the you know, Yellow River floods and I needed to know all of that stuff if I was going to understand the Chinese Civil War and what happened in 1949 and when everything that's happened since then. So if I was going to understand current events current policies and current worldviews of other people, I needed to dig down and I needed to know their history and their literature. And I've always said, you know, learn people's fairy tales because fairy tales are how cultures transmit values. Um, so I, I had that, I had learned how to think that way. And certainly it was useful in my early tours. But when I changed regions and I moved over to the Middle East, and when I was recruited for the Middle East Bureau, I did say to them, I've never met an Arab. I, as at least as far as I knew. Um, and they said, that's fine. I have a whole office full of people who know the Gulf, um, but I was being hired for other skills. But when I got into the Middle East, okay, I said, okay, I don't know anything about this place. Ah. I need to go do the literature and the fairy tales and the history. And I knew how to look, how to understand a region. And I took those intellectual skills and I moved them over and I self-taught myself. You know, I found people in books and things to do. So I learned the Middle East. And then when I was the director for East Africa, I had to do it all over again. So it's not so much the what you learn in the university, although, you know, yes, do, do pass your multiple choice test. Um, it's learning how to think through a problem and a region. 
And so, you know, you've been to Japan. And so your understanding of Japan goes beyond whatever you learned in school. But the school part, you know, when I graduated from grad school, we were all terribly arrogant that we had learned far more sitting around in the lobby of the library, talking and arguing, debating for hours with each other than we did in the classroom. Well, took me a little while to figure it out that what we were arguing and debating about and everything else was the stuff that we had gotten in class. And then we argued about it and everything else. So it's the basic intellectual skills. It's learning how to learn. And if you learn how to learn, you can then go off and do almost anything and learn how to learn it. It's also, and I've noticed this teaching this year post COVID, there are tremendous social skills you learn going to school. Because I, I don't know about anybody else who teaches, but this year teaching, my students are acting like they're on a Brady Bunch, a Zoom call. And they're all sitting there. Yeah, and it's like, no, talk, argue, interrupt, think figure out how to do this, you know, open up. And so I, it, it really wasn't until this year when I saw the absence of it, that I realized how important that whole social dynamic of disagreeing with your professor, your professor's an idiot. And you're going to graciously, intellectually and professionally explain to her why she's an idiot. But you're not just gonna say, you're, an, you're not gonna troll her and say, you're an idiot you're gonna to have to explain why she's an idiot. And if you do, she'll love you uh, for doing that. You're gonna argue with your friends. You're gonna have, you're gonna be exposed to all sorts of new ideas that you have to process. And so the university experience is something where you learn the skills as well as language and some you know, useful stuff that that's what's gonna make you successful. Thank you, Barbara. That was, I find your career so fascinating because my my parents, they actually were born in Baghdad too. So they they survived wow. uh, <laughs> and they they actually moved to Japan. And that's where that's where that comes from, actually, is because I wow. grew up there for um, around eight years. And so from that experience, it kind of made me have that worldview, as you mentioned, of having. And you know, your 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 career is very fascinating to me, and I hope to maybe maybe venture into foreign service someday. That would be super. Yeah. That would be super. And a, a Japan raised a rocky French speaking American. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, sure, we can do that. <laughs> cool, cool. That would be super. Okay, anybody else? Thank you so much. Okay, Luke Brothers put in our next asked question here. Luke, I wonder if you'd like to read it out loud or if you'd like me to read it. Luke? Sure, Please. I'd be happy to read it. Yeah, and I, I just came on video here. Hi, Ambassador Bodine. Uh, thanks for giving us your time and thanks to organizers for this, this event. So I was in your class 20, 20 years ago that you co-taught with Mark Jurgensmeyer. Oh and my God. I remember God. You, you spent so much time lecturing. I remember back then at the time being confused, but you spent a lot of time speaking about the Uyghurs in Western China and foreseeing the challenges that the United States was about to go into with the Muslim world. And I, the question is mostly how, you know, using that crystal ball, because you obviously have one, that materializes a major international concern. Um, um, my question is about what issues could we focus on now that uh, will emerge as an, as an issue in 15 to 20 years? And I'll throw in a little bonus comment. At the time, I was a junior, and I thought it was so cool that you had office hours. And I thought, <laughs> I want to go in and meet, I want to meet her. And so I thought of a few questions and I came in and I asked you a bunch of questions. I said, I'm very serious and I want to pursue this. And uh, meeting you uh, gave me all sorts of confidence. And so I, I later on, I went to work as a civilian at NATO headquarters. And so as the first time I had to go meet a ambassador a diplomat, I was like, oh, I, I hung out with Barbara Bodine. So I'm, I'm, I, can, I, I can rub elbows with you guys. So I think at the time it was very, it was very great of you to to meet with students and to give your time to those students because you you expose them all to this world. And uh, so uh, 
So thank you for that. Thank you very much. That's that's wonderful. Oh my God. Um, I love office hours. I love meeting with students. Um, and hearing this, you know, coming back at me, thank you so much. Um, you've made my day. Um, going forward, um, I know it's almost a cliche, but I think I don't think we've 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 we we broadly really understand the impact that climate disruption is going to have on the world. Um, that you know we we you know I know you guys we all know about it in our daily lives and we all intellectually know it and we see it in different places, but. Um, the there is going to be a a mass dislocation of populations around the world um and we're, we already see it coming out of africa um but the whole concept of this humans have been migrating because of climate for a long time you know ice ages you know anyway we've been you know that's what we do we we, we follow herds uh initially um, and so we've always been, we are climate dependent creatures, but the climate is going to be changing in ways and, and trying to figure out where do people go, where they can have food, where they can have water, where they can have safety, um, is going to mean a reshuffling of the world's population that, that we may not have seen since you know, we all walked out of East Africa a couple of million years ago. Um, and we're still kind of sorting out even now who we are. Um, we've, we're have we rethinking the whole concept of citizenship, nationality, ethnicity, where do we belong, who belongs with us? And that's, it, it's, it's clearly already causing turmoil. Um, and, I think this is going to be the major challenge going forward is, you know, to use Chad, if I may, you know, he's a Rocky, a Rocky born or a Rocky parents, raised in Japan, lives in America, studied in France. Okay, so what is he? He's actually all the above. He's not none of the above, he's all the above. And some people get to do that by choice. Some people do it by necessity. Um, and then there is that whole, when you find yourself in this environment where you are not a majority and almost everybody's not part of the majority because actually the majority are women. So guess what? Um, but we're all not part of a majority. We're all part of minorities and we're all trying to figure out where do we fit together and how do we, how do we make it work? Um, the number of students I have who, who sound like Chad, you know, where, you know, the, they check all the boxes and then add a few more just for fun. Um, and that's going to be, that's going to be a, a human challenge. It's going to be an economic challenge and it's going to end up being a political challenge as we sort that out. And everything that comes from that and then falls out of that is going to be what you guys are sorting out. And the fact that you've done education abroad, you're already thinking globally. And I think it's an old tire bumper sticker that my generation may even have come up with because we came up with everything, including all the good music, um, is, is to think globally and act locally. And that sounds so trite and it's so accurate. And maybe climate change is also, you know, slapping us upside the head to making us understand that there are no communities anymore. You can't sit in your community and literally build a wall around it and keep bad stuff out. Pandemics don't care. Climate change doesn't care. Food insecurity doesn't care. And so these things we have to care about, we have to, we have to do them collaboratively, even if we don't like each other. So check back with me in 20 years and tell me if I was right.
I look forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Um, Mary, are, uh, do you want to ask the next question, Mary Metcalf? I think you're, uh, hi, there, there you are. Hi. Hi, Mary. Oh, yeah. It's Mari, actually. Thank Mari. you. Oh, Mari. Yeah. Hi, Ambassador Bodin. Um, First of all, I'm just so thrilled that you are such a high profile advocate of what I call the gospel of study abroad. Oh. So rock on. Um, yeah. So my question was, could you please elaborate on your earlier comment about the recent election in the Philippines? And also, um, sort of as a related note, like, do you think that it was a fair election? Do you think that to what extent was it fair? To what extent did it reflect just a massive disinformation campaign that they mounted through Facebook? And then also, do you see that election result as being related in any way to any other recent results in elections throughout the world? Whoa, okay. Um, and my short answer to that is uh, yes, I guess. I think, first of all, I mean, the, the Philippine elections are, you know, horrific. One thing that they do is, I think we need to rethink what constitutes a fair election. Um, by all accounts, the voting was done properly, counted properly, the numbers are accurate. And it was, uh, by 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 many standards a, a an open campaign so by sort of conventional metrics it was a fair election comma however the role of disinformation in skewing the democratic process because a fair election always assume that there was a relatively fair access to information, accurate information. You know, candidates have always tweaked things a little bit. You know, it's, there's, there's never been full transparency and full candor. But first of all, there was a way of fact checking it. And also, if you found that the, op, you know, the, the other guy had lied egregiously, you'd call them out on it and they would be literally shamed. Well, there's not a whole lot of shame left. Um, now, so, so the election people were voting on a reasonable expectation of what the truth of those candidates was. Now with disinformation and Facebook, the disinformation is so grotesque that people are voting on what they think is the truth. They're voting on what they think are the facts. So in a sense, the voters are doing the right thing, except they've been fed garbage. And the ability to counter disinformation is, God, that's something that, you know, we work on, everybody's working on is how do you fight back on this? And it's, it's hard. Um, and um, so it was a free and fair election by conventional metrics. It was a totally distorted election if you look at the core element of an election, which is sorting out the pros and cons of candidates. It was also horrifying, and I think this is something we, you know, we're all seeing, is the rewriting of history. And again, people have rewritten their histories. You know, we all do that. Um, we're all heroes of our own stories and, and all of that. But the fact that we have rewritten the Marcos years within one generation um, with people alive who knew Ferdinand Sr. and know what he was. Um, and the fact that we have a Marcos Duterte thing is just good God in heaven. Um, I think it, it is a, to go back to Luke's question, something that, that is also going to be a major challenge is in a sense, what is democracy anymore? If, if the whole campaign and the whole information environment can be that distorted, how can even a good citizen make a valid choice in what is otherwise a credible process? So process is no longer, we, it, it's not the process of the elections that is now the issue. 
it's not somebody stuffing a ballot box or, you know, doing the old fashioned kind of, 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 of election stealing. It's now so perverting the information that you can have a perfectly fine process, but the election is a fraud. And that's, that's going to be a harder one to get a hold of. And it's something that we see here. Nobody is immune from this. And how do you, you know, I hope we have the kind of history and the kind of societies that at some point we can go back and judge Mr. Zuckerberg for what he's done. Um, because this, I, it's not a, it's not an, it's, it's not sharing truth, it's sharing lies. And um, so I think that we, we saw a lot in the Philippine elections that should give us pause and somehow redouble our efforts. I don't know what the solution is, but what we saw in the Philippines is not going to end in the Philippines. We're going to see variations on valid process, invalid campaigning. Sorry, not happy talk. <laughs> well, what, uh, what an optimistic note to end on. Thank you so much. Dear. Oh, <laughs> we, we, but, okay, I can tell you that hitchhiking around the world as a 22-year-old, as a 20-year-old, cool, as 20-year-old a 20 20 is a cool thing to do. Mm. Don't let your child do what I did. I have no idea how I survived it. But you did. So. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, anyway, thank you all. I wish we could just keep going and going, but um, I, I respect your time. So thank you. Thank and you. Um, Elizabeth and, and, and Bryn have my email if you want to follow up with any, any comments. I'd, I'd love to. I will not answer any comments, however, until May 23rd because we're heading into graduation week and my life is going nutty. But if you send me an email after May 23rd, I will answer it. What I'll do is go ahead and there's a few more questions in chat and I'll send those to you. And then oh, yeah. whenever you have a chance, you can you can answer those. Thank, Thank you, you so much, everyone. It's been wonderful to see so many familiar faces again. And uh, a special uh, thanks to Ambassador Bodine. A lovely for you to take time today. Uh, your comments were really uh, just so valuable. Uh, and I think we have a lot of younger um, alumni on the call today who are going to get a lot out of what you said about um, your experiences abroad and, and your your career. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure. It was a thank pleasure. You. And it was also nice to see some other gray hair too. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Let's see.